RCC coordination mechanisms must proactively engage with the operational clusters or the equivalent coordination mechanisms. A lessons learned is that the best people to engage communities are those who have existing trusted relationships. So this is vital in ending disease outbreaks and it underpins, underpins all our uh, RCC efforts. So in this regard, and again, I would also like to stress what you mentioned, William, in the opening remarks, it's, it's important to have those trusted local organizations with common cultural, linguistic, and historical knowledge, because those are the best place to engage community, communities. Also, those local organizations should have access to RCCE coordination mechanisms and to the technical information that they need to engage communities around COVID-19. And an example will be provided uh, during this session on uh, what happened in the West Africa region in this regard. So, and thirdly, but not lastly, affected communities, they do not distinguish between RCCE or accountability to affected people or community engagement. So neither should we do. So strong partnerships or ideally integration within existing AP or community engagement working groups or the equivalent coordination mechanisms, this will be key to unlock the potential benefits of collaboration between these complementary people-centered approaches. And later on, Pilar and Diana will share an example from uh, the Americas regions uh, or region in that regard. So I think it's important to dive into the more concrete examples after having set the scene a bit on you know, what it is and why it is important and specifically in our interagency context. So with this short introduction to RCCE, let me introduce Mathieu Laruelle. Mathieu is advisor on risk education at the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining. So Mathieu, over to you to present the main findings of the research on new methodologies and new technologies for risk education in challenging context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Machtold. Sorry, was looking for the mic. Uh, good morning, afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, let me start with a question. Um, what is explosive ordnance risk education or what we call E or RE? To strengthen what William said in his uh, inspiring uh, opening remarks, it is first and foremost a right uh, and by this I mean that all communities living in explosive ordnance contaminated areas have the right to be informed about the risk in their environments um, and to know how to protect themselves and their families from that risk. Today I will provide uh, some examples of a review that we conducted. Um, but risk education, first of all, I wanted to, to uh, clarify is one of the five pillars of mine action that aims at reducing um, death and injuries from explosive ordnance by raising awareness of affected communities based on their vulnerabilities, needs, and roles, and also by promoting behavioral change. And digital tools um, offer new possibilities to answer to the needs of communities affected by explosive hazards. I'm part of a team of two working at the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining based in Geneva. Uh, working on risk education. The GICHD is an active member of the Mine Action Area of Responsibility, uh, leading on information management, but also uh, supporting work on risk education. Oops, technical problem, there. Um, today I will share um, some key takeaways of a review on technologies and methodologies for um, explosive ordnance risk education that we um, conducted this year. The review is available online at the website that you see on the slides and it includes a dedicated resource library where you can filter specifically for resources related to technologies. We're also planning to organize a virtual side event uh, later or a virtual workshop later this year to discuss and build on, on findings with different sectors. This research was conducted on behalf of what is called the EORE Advisory Group. It is a group of over a dozen organizations, international NGOs, but also UN agencies, including UNMAS, UNDP, UNHCR, IOM, that got together in 2019 
concern about the sharp increase of um, explosive ordnance victims uh, globally. It is chaired by UNICEF and uh, an other rotating NGO currently Minds Advisory Group, and it reports regularly to the MAAOR. The objective of that group is to help revert the upward trend in explosive ordnance victims and provide guidance to risk education uh, practitioners globally. Now, as, as um, William mentioned in his opening, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I mean, it started during our research uh, and it undeniably accelerated an already growing interest in digital um, initiatives to deliver risk education, especially in hard to reach areas. It also served as a catalyst to improve coordination efforts um, with the protection, public health, um, behavior change and the RCC sectors. And in fact, there are um, numerous examples of risk education programs already present in communities that have developed integrated COVID-19 and uh, EORE materials and messaging. And this event is really an opportunity to learn even more from each other um, and grow. So we have found um, through our research that there are generally five broad categories of technologies being used in, uh, for risk education to date um, with varying degrees, social media and digital communication platforms, digital apps, augmented and virtual reality, the risk education talking device and various mobile data collection tools. Social media campaigns uh, through Facebook, WhatsApp or YouTube are the most commonly used to reach and share information with massive number of people, um, generally in a one-way communication channel. Um, they have, however, the advantage of re reaching people directly where they are. One interesting example that you see on the top, on the bottom left of the screen is the use of Facebook ads by Minds Advisory Group. Um, through an alliance with the Department of State, the Iraqi Directorate for Mine Action and Facebook, MAG used Facebook's advertising tools as part of a broader risk education um, campaign to deliver life-saving messages to almost 1 million Iraqis um, in a very specific region where people were returning after heavy fighting. It was generally reported um, through our interviews that social media platforms represent an easily scalable and also cost-effective way of reaching large group of people, as I said, especially young people. Um, and where security, geography, or complex operating environments limit the delivery of face-to-face -face activities. Another positive element is that most tools can be easily updated to adapt to changing circumstances, uh, which is key for environments in flux or that, that change rapidly. The research also shows that digital campaign seems to be most, most effective when a wide variety of tools or channels or platforms are combined. Um, using an edutainment approach, for instance, uh, with different graphics, visuals, uh, videos, interactive tools, such as games and quizzes. Digital apps um, have also been increasingly used to deliver life-saving messages, but also to train spe specific target groups like, like teachers in Syria. Augmented reality, virtual reality, or what we call extended reality generally are also fields in full expansion that can contribute to uh, enhancing uh, in our field uh, knowledge retention and generate behavior change. But this says, this said, sorry, um, we're also reminded through the research that innovation does not just mean the latest technology uh, or the greatest technology. Um, being innovative is also about rethinking, reevaluating our practices like, uh, like was said also at, at the beginning and putting back communities at the center in light of the changing context, um, but also developing context specific low tech responses that I know some of my colleagues will present after. So for instance, sending mass communications through SMS is still often the most um, preferred channel of communication uh, with software is allowing uh, two way communication. Pre-recorded audio messages are also used to reach at-risk communities via SMS on microcards in, in, in public transport, through loudspeakers or radio station. And you have one example on the top, uh, on the bottom right of this slide, which is called the risk education talking device. It's a device that was developed by UNMAS in South Sudan. It's solar powered um, and it allows to upload pre-recorded messages, songs, dramas, interviews, podcasts, etc. you name it. Um, 
for audiences with no to low connectivity, low literacy levels or, or oral traditions. And it could be used for any other thematic. Now, practitioners we interviewed uh, for this review highlighted the importance of upholding certain key principles at the moment of conceptualizing um, digital tools. One key principle referred to something that um, William alluded to, um, and it's the need to develop div digital responses that are also rooted in a robust context analysis. Um, a context analysis that should inform who's at risk, the tailoring of the messages, the selection of communication vehicles, including the relevance of digital tools. And this needs analysis should also be gender diversity and disability and um, disability sensitive, you know, looking at impairment, looking at age, language, uh, literacy, display, displacement status, migration status, um, socioeconomic status, uh, rural versus uh, urban locations, but also looking at gender norms or what is expected from girls, boys, uh, men and women in specific context. And finally, security elements, uh, such as the sensitivity of the information, restriction or certain digital tools and access to the internet and smartphones. Um, and the same level of ideas, the risk education sector is now increasingly uh, developing interventions, interventions that are rooted in behavior change uh, approaches, where time is really dedicated to listening, to sharing with communities and analyzing behavioral drivers. Not analyzing or taking you know, these, these factors into account will limit the effectiveness of, of risk communication um, and the digi digital tools used. Another key building block that William also mentioned in the beginning is uh, that was highlighted in this review is the role of trust. Um, digital tools works best when the organization has a relationship with the communities where mutual trust and understanding have already been established. Some respondents in our review emphasize that the success of their social media campaign was mainly due or largely due to their long presence in a country. Um, their links and the trust built with the communities um, through the focal points, leaders, etc. And in that same vein, um, many also emphasize that digital campaigns should generally complement and not substitute other risk education activities, including at face to face level. We've also noticed um, additional two additional uh, common factors between actors uh, that have successfully developed digital projects. And the first one is that they have adopted an internal culture of innovation uh, and shown willingness to work across organizations, across sectors, across national boundaries on challenges of mutual concern. The other one is partnerships. Um, so these organizations have created strong partnerships by bringing to people, bring together people from other sectors to capitalize on their expertise, their know-how, such as information and you know the information and communication technology, local technology companies, uh, big tech innovation labs, marketing companies, etc. The Safe Steps project in Colombia illustrates this, or Paso Seguros. It's an alliance between the US uh, International Development Agency, the Barco Foundation, Discovery Communications, and a government entity that focuses on bridging the digital divide between rural and urban areas. This project uses multi -digital, multiple digital platforms and tools to respond to the, uh, to the needs and questions of different audiences uh, through VR games, TV series, online trainings, etc. Now to, to conclude, um, I'd just like to highlight the fact that this review uh, has shown that the risk education sector is only um, beginning to explore the potential of digital technologies and RCCE. Um, and combined with you know, the RCC, BCC and, and uh, digital tools combined can only help us deepen our impact uh, by creating a two-way dialogue with com communities at risk by generating meaningful engagement, uh, allowing feedback, integrating, integrating people's voices and priorities. Um, and one project brings these elements um, together. Um, it is evidence-based, 
It's founded on a strong partnership with the private sector. It uses multiple platforms and it addresses multiple risk factors. Um, and I'm here, I'm pleased to give the floor to uh, the next panelist, André heller Pirage, who's the director of uh, the Signpost Project based at the International Rescue Committee. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions through the chat later uh, and uh, over to you, André, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for the kind introduction uh, and uh, compelling presentations thus far and especially thanks everyone for attending uh, and spending some of your time with us today. Um, I uh, am uh, the director of the Signpost Project and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about that uh, in relation to how we're working with RCCE, uh, specifically related to COVID. Um, but what I'll do is I think that this will be more useful to the group uh, is tell you a little bit more about the program, uh, how it operates, uh, a little bit about its history, uh, about the tools and the technology that we use uh, and how it is uh, that we deliver and how uh, we're also uh, growing our consortium and we're growing our global footprint. And I'd like to make that known so that others can engage. Um, I'm looking at time and we're a little bit behind. So I'm gonna go through the presentation relatively quickly and um, be happy to answer any outstanding questions should anyone have any um, when, uh, when the presentation is over via the chat. Um, so without further ado, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, RCCE um, in, uh, uh, generally poses a lot of challenges um, uh, in any infectious disease uh, response. Um, there are, there is often a, a sort of overload of information. Um, it's often very difficult to work in a genuinely cross-sectoral way. Um, there's a lot of efforts put into this, but it, it's just very difficult for our, our architecture to truly embrace this and do it. Um, there is generally um, a wealth of risk communication uh, messaging that exists, but in terms of the links with the community engagement, uh, in the time of COVID, um, the community engagement side is particularly difficult given the uh, given the public health advice um, or strict restrictions uh, in our ability to move about and interact with people these days. So the community engagement needs to shift towards uh, digital means. Um, reaching people with risk communication is one thing, but engaging with communities uh, is something entirely different and very difficult. Um, one of the other pieces related to RCCE uh, in an infectious disease outbreak is that things are evolving very quickly. Uh, and it's very difficult to assess and evaluate impact uh, and behavior change in real time as things are uh, rapidly evolving. Uh, next slide, please. And so Signpost uh, is a, a responsive information service um, that is deployed digitally. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our history. Um, we, as a project, came into being um, in 2015 uh, in Greece through a collaboration with Mercy Corps and the IRC. Uh, where we built uh, a service map, an interactive service map, um, and a moderation uh, platform uh, and an article publication platform in response to the many, many migrants, um, asylum seekers, and refugees uh, who were coming into Greece uh, at the time and looking for orientation. Um, people could largely take care of themselves on some levels but had questions on others. Uh, and essentially what we saw was uh, changing information needs uh, over the arc of the crisis and as their situation changed and evolved. Um, there was a lot of complex, bureaucratic, uh, heavy, uh, difficult processes for people to engage with um, on a number of levels. So really truly understanding um, information and in um, a language that makes sense and in, in a parlance that makes sense uh, was what we delivered on. And now this program started in Greece uh, and it grew uh, substantially throughout the entire region into the Balkans and uh, Italy um, and then uh, beyond. And I'll talk a bit more about the technical aspects in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that platform that we created uh, is called uh, Refugee Info. Uh, and Refugee Info um, is, uh, is still uh, going strong today in Italy and Greece. Um, we've handed over to local partners in, in, uh, in, in Macedonia or in, uh, in, in, in uh, Bulgaria. Um, in uh, the Americas, we created Quintanos, um, which uh, is a program that was created a number of years ago to uh, uh, help uh, victims of domestic violence and gang violence 
So also protection needs, um, but a very different uh, context. Um, and there we adapted a model where we were working more through service providers of different sorts. Um, and uh, the program has expanded from El Salvador to Honduras and Guatemala. Uh, and we've recently launched uh, uh, InfoPerante, which is a new platform in uh, Colombia, working in partnership uh, with a local responsive information service called Estoy en la Frontera um, to deliver on information needs uh, for the many uh, vulnerable people and um, displaced uh, migrants or temporary status uh, people looking for orientation from uh, Venezuela. Um, next slide, please. You'll note on the previous slide that Refugee Info, Cuentanos, and Info Pelante um, did not have a Mercy Corps IRC uh, branding, but they had local brands. Um, the localization of the brand is really important to us as a program. Uh, we want it to speak to the lived context of people um, rather than to the institution um, that, you know, achieved the the funding required to launch the program. We want it to feel right and to look right to people. And we're kind of deliberate about uh, not branding it um, IRC. Uh, we, don't, we don't brand it signpost either for that matter. Um, we just localize it. Um, we want to have a more de decolonized approach towards the way that we present ourselves. Um, we'd rather present from the community who actually makes up our personnel and our staff and who's really running and leading the program. And so responsive information services and the way that Signpost runs them um, is really comprised of a, of, of a couple of components. One is a suite of technology, which I'll talk about in a sec, um, a, a consortium of partners, and those are local, uh, private sector, uh, international, um, and staff that is skilled, trained, uh, reflecting affected communities, um, all applying evidence-based methodologies that we've researched and published about um, that, uh, that really are the, 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 the lifeblood of the program. So the technology tools that we use, um, while they all look, uh, while they're all actually extremely complex, uh, we work with companies like Google and Zendesk and Twilio and Box and TripAdvisor, um, and they've helped us uh, put together a suite of technology tools and using a lot of pre-existing tools um, that are already pri powering the private sector um, to deliver in a way that just feels natural to people. So for the most part, we meet people on platforms that they already use in the languages that they already speak through translation software and through uh, having staff uh, to help out with that. Uh, and uh, we have a quite complex back end that we help uh, sort of pipe through the different communication channels to power websites in multiple languages. Uh, and to deploy web-based content um, via, you know, WhatsApp and things like this uh, using certain products. Um, so the experience feels perfectly normal um, and natural and low-tech uh, or just, you know, using existing platforms. Uh, but in reality, there's a lot behind it. Um, so uh, our partnerships is a real key component of the work that we do. Um, we partner uh, with uh, big technology companies, but we also always have a network of local partners to play various components of our programming, whether it is uh, referral pathways uh, for protection uh, uh, cases, uh, whether uh, it is um, a service mapping, um, a local actor, um, or if it's a, a group of people who engage with communities to support us in moderation. Um, and. Uh, we work with, uh, we, we work with um, a team always on the ground. And sometimes local partners will play uh, one of the team roles. Um, and so uh, essentially the components of the program are moderators, editorial content producers, uh, and service mappers. Um, the moderators will have engagement with people, um, sort of back and forth communications about questions. They will help orient people towards the services that they need. And um, the editorial supervisors will use this iterative process, this back and forth communication to understand and we quantify and sort of track what questions are, to understand them better, to have our content evolve over time and have the information products that we create reflect the information needs in a population. And we publish those, uh, of, of course, in the most simple uh, client facing uh, possible language, uh, visual uh, communication tools uh, and so on. Uh, so that it actually is understandable uh, by those people um, and actually really speaks to their lived reality. Um, one of the things that we find is general information often counts as, uh, as, 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 as not applicable if it doesn't actually speak to your lived reality and how to apply that in your context. 
Uh, next slide, please. And on this slide, if you can just click through quickly. Um, so this charts user engagement on Facebook in refugee info uh, over the course of the quarantine in Italy. Um, we've reached a total of 2 million people in the program so far. And one of the things that's most important to us is to measure trust uh, in a population. And in our most recent user surveys, uh, we had 88% trust uh, of the users that we have. While trust is not a proxy uh, for behavior change, it is a key component uh, to help getting the right messages there to enable it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Signpost project is in the process of scaling. Um, we currently work in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Italy, uh, and Greece, and Colombia. Um, but we're soon scaling in Pakistan, Mexico, Bangladesh, Kenya, Iraq, and Niger. Uh, and we hope that this process continues. Um, it is our mission at Signpost uh, to deliver on information as a human right. And we have a broad interpretation of this human right. Um, we believe that information is aid and information is power. Um, and we uh, want to work in partnership and in consortium with other international actors as well as local actors, um, as well as embracing uh, all of the uh, best in class technology of our technology partners. Um, so we hope on that note that you can reach out uh, after this presentation and we hope that you can join us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in doing a lot of the work uh, that we have ahead of us, uh, we'll all need to collaborate. Uh, and on that note, um, I am going to introduce our next speaker. Um, and sorry if I went over. Um, Vincent Briard uh, from UNHCR will now present. Um, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, thank you, thank you, Andre. Uh, very inspiring presentation. Uh, some of us have used uh, refugee info in Greece in previous operations, so that was uh, very inspiring. So, uh, hello, everybody. Um, let me share a few considerations, uh, reflections, and possibly provocations from our region, West and Central Africa region. Uh, first of all, uh, a step back, if you don't mind, I'm trying to have this correct. I would you to have a look, closer look at this uh, poster in uh, Central Sahara, Mali, Mopti bus station from March. So let's get back to March. Uh, what do you see? He's, uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to have the presenter view here. Sorry. Here we go. Uh, we had to face this type of uh, social uh, and poster content. Somebody somewhere in an office so it was a good idea to use the size of a pair of skis and a yoga mat in Mali to explain the two meters social distance. And this is my first point, in that at any moment, we aid workers uh, community, we, are, we have been and we are potentially every day uh, guy. Can you hear me? It's, I think your connection is not strong enough to host the video. Vincent, would you kindly turn off your video? Maybe that'll okay. improve the sound. Thank you. Is it better? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay sorry for that. The connection is, is, is precarious a bit here. So basically, uh, the first uh, golden rule one in, in our COVID experience is to be modest and aware of ourselves and our good intentions. Many things, angles are wrong in this poster. Mopti is a small town of Central Sahel with no ski resort in Francophone Mali. The text is in English mixed with uh, small fragments of French. Uh, yoga may be uh, growing, but not much. So it's a diverse city and, and region with uh, Bozos, Pearl, Bambara, Dogon, populations, languages, Maraca, Tuareg, a lot of IDPs and refugees taking this bus. And these people, these voices are not captured into this picture. We uh, only see a couple of men with executive pack suit suitcases. So of course it's uh, an exaggeration, it's a reality, it's an extreme illustration, uh, but it says something on some of our shortcomings and challenges uh, mentioned by a few colleagues and, and by William in the introduction. In applying this golden rule uh, number two in, in our efforts to communicate better with communities, that all messages should be contextualized and adapted to the target community whenever possible. So this is uh, challenging, yes, and time consuming, but, uh, but worth it. Another, sorry. 
Another uh, step back in March again, uh, I made especially this meme for you. Uh, we all reacted very quickly with one of our favorite uh, much needed tool, SOPs and guidelines. So I hope I will not be sued by Oprah Winfrey. She incarnates here uh, ourselves, our <laughs> headquarters, our regional offices. My point is that many of us in the region, many organizations, colleagues, we felt overwhelmed uh, by the plethora of good guidance note handbooks on uh, COVID-19. So many were extremely useful ones, especially RCC guidance note. But every brew, uh, week we, we had to, to, to decide and uh, to uh, screen a new set of guidance notes to help to disseminate share. Uh, and we kind of overwhelmed ourselves and community mobil mobilizer. Many were not very adapted to the context and we had to plan something on this front acknowledge the guidance, but to, to try to make it real. So basically, uh, as an agency first, we started to, to draw around uh, our planning around four guiding principles. First, to acknowledge and remind permanently that uh, the persons we serve are also overwhelmed with information. So the need to use clear and simple language and to adopt multiple challenges of communication including social media to reach diverse groups was, was key. But also the quality of the, of the channels, whether digital or analog, had to be there in the sense of consistency, transparency, so that we have a, an empathetic response and, and to be able to build this authority and trust that was mentioned earlier, earlier on. Other consideration has been key to acknowledge and normalize feelings of confusion, stress, this was a psychological crisis, and we had to, to translate that into, into action. And another part is uh, that we needed to address in a more creative way, maybe the concerns and rumors and, and, and misinformation. So basically, this was the context to launch our uh, interagency digital library, which is what you see on the screen, this user-friendly simplified web website. The context is a creation of the working group, the regional one in March, chaired by UNICEF. We felt it was critical, urgent to communicate uh, better on what is known about COVID, what is unknown, what is being known. And we realized two, three people at the beginning, we wanted to go simple, to enhance a bit the do-it-yourself philosophy, to be, I would say, pragmatical, embrace digital efforts in close link with analog formats, with also a protection approach. So the rapid decision was to take, we need to focus on art, on imaginaries on local habits and uh, practices. This means engaging visuals to try to calibrate our audiences. And so basically I want to make this point. It took literally a couple of ideas, three, four individuals committed to this until now $2,000 budget. Uh, and we felt it was time to have this central and public space vis-a-vis uh, -vis the overwhelming context I mentioned in the beginning and to share the best RCC materials from the region, whether locally produced or adapted in different formats and languages. So today, uh, and in this journey, we screened from five to 10,000 different items, uh, 350 tools. It is a francophone first and has also 20 other languages, audio, visual, social media content, uh, all free for download. The use is intuitive search functions so that the users can find the right tool for their own context and start using it immediately. The social media campaign building on this experience was launched in August. I will let you explore the site by category. Uh, we have more than 16 categories by country, by language. And um, I insist it's been, and then the newsletter, the e-learning and the social media campaign created in-house with staff support from IOM, UNICEF, UNHCR and MSF. Uh, agency who, are, who, who sometimes uh, struggle to, to work closely together in emergency. So a lot of time and effort and creativity has been put uh, into, into this process. We upload twice a week curated tools and um, very quickly a few numbers. So it was beyond expectation. We, had, uh, we have now uh, around 30,000 unique visitors, 10,000 regular users, 60% uh, female, most from the regions now, 63% return to the platform. In other UNHCR measurement tools, we have uh, from a sample of 
800 key informants also uh, satisfaction on the COVID information thanks to these tools of 92%. So it proved to be, uh, to be um, helpful. I will go very quickly um, on, uh, on the visuals of the Facebook campaign, etc. Uh, the branding has been very important. So it was a no-logo approach costs us $500. It's easy to remember, and this is why we still have 74% of direct uh, access to the site, and referrals, including from uh, social networks, are, uh, constitute the rest. The targets, uh, we'll be quick on that, two types of target audiences. Of course, community mobilizers from UN NGOs agencies, local NGOs, international NGOs, using mainly uh, the website and uh, the Facebook social network, uh, different profiles uh, to use uh, the tools and the content on mobile service, WhatsApp trees, and other uh, Facebook uh, applications. I'm sorry, my connection is a bit uh, unstable. I see I, I took a lot of time, so I will go uh, to, to, to the last uh, considerations. Basically, I will go very quickly. This was to show a bit and to illustrate the, the fact that the challenge to engage in a cross-sectoral sector is not as simple as it may seem to be multifunctional with a multidisciplinary approach and to build a solid partnership. So what was key is, to, to, is our capacity to listen to each other's expertise uh, and to the persons we serve, especially I would say between three types of, of sapiens, the, the human rights protection people, the comms people and the tech people. And when we have um, a truly uh, a, a proper environment based on principles and pragmatism, it, it may happen. So we, we have a lot to discuss about this, but I will go directly since I lost time <laughs> with my presentation on key final considerations, if you don't mind. Basically, partnership. For some reason, we managed to have a genuine, transparent, no logo, uh, based on values uh, partnership between these big agencies and local CBOs. Uh, it's been result oriented and it's a refreshing climate of trust in a, in a very competitive environment. I wanted to, to stress that. Also, pragmatically, uh, we, we don't need to be a geek. Many of us community-based protection people, we are generalists, but we need to know our basics and to, to take the profit of the, the, the digital world and the analog um, engagement that must go together. The need to address specific needs based on age, gender, diversity has been stressed already and probably by the next panelists too. But this has been key to tailor and calibrate our, our, our messaging and also the feedback uh, from, from uh, the persons we serve. Uh, obviously, um, the communication issues uh, have, been, uh, have been keys in terms of language, imaginary access to, to mobile technology. But my, my point is that these are a lot of protection issues involved and not only comes and this has been uh, I would say one of the difficulties to, to, to have a consensus and, and I join a bit uh, the introduction of William in this sense. There's still much more to be done. We still need to do much better than that. Uh, it's been very complicated to, to present uh, in such a, a short period of time, but the key uh, in our work uh, interagency and as an agency uh, has been to, to listen, to listen and to listen. Do we do it enough? I am not sure. Uh, we are engaging on a connectivity uh, assessment right now and communication uh, pilot projects to enhance and, and make the best of it. And we realize that we need uh, much more reliable data on that to, to go beyond assumptions and, uh, and, and uh, in a humble but determined manner. Thank you for your patience and sorry for the, for the connection. The floor now is to Vivian Fluck. She's a uh, coordination for East uh, Asia and Pacific for the Federation of the Red Cross. She's a coordinator of community engagement and accountability. And I have to say that uh, Vivian, um, we have translated the first week of the pandemic, your document uh, that you will present today. So it's, it's uh, by pure chance. So it's an honor to introduce to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Apologies, I just needed to unmute myself for a second because um, the panel 
disappeared. Thanks so much for that very kind introduction, Vincent. That's uh, great to hear that um, that has been translated. Um, I'm going to switch off my camera now. I just wanted to switch it on for a second that you know who is talking to you, um, because you've heard already from a lot of uh, amazing people. Um, and I will now put my presentation in the um, full screen mode. Um, yes, so I work in Asia and the Pacific region, as you've just heard. And um, because we're kind of halfway, uh, we have a poll for you to kind of wake you up a little bit and um, make sure that you're not just uh, listening, but uh, can participate a little bit. Um, would it be possible to start the poll now, please? Okay, so on your screen, you see a little pop-up window. And um, the first question is, are you currently using community data? And with that, I mean anything that could be feedback, perception surveys, or similar in your work. And the second question is, how long would you like my presentation to last? Now, don't worry, this is completely anonymous, so you can say one minute. Um, I, you know, um, I, I won't be able to say who said that and who doesn't want to hear anything from me. Um, I see one brave uh, person already chose one minute and, and two. Um, the majority of you is saying 10 minutes. Uh, great. So you have a few more seconds to vote. Right now, only 50% of you have voted. 54%. Um, uh, great. So I give you another couple of seconds to uh, make your choice and um, tell me. It's great to see that a big majority of you has been using community data in your work. So almost um, 80%. And um, we uh, see that most of you want to have about 10 minutes of presentation. Okay. so. Having asked you this question, I'm going to end the polling now because we're running a bit over time and I will share the results with you. So you can see that the majority of you wants me to speak for 10 minutes. I'm starting my timer right now um, and I might even be a little bit under to also please the uh, 6%, but I, I won't be going over. So I'm really sorry for the 18%. So let me ask you, do you feel like you've participated through this question? I've asked you a question. Have you participated? Feel free to use the chat box. Not really. No, not properly. Yes. So, so. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, not really. Yes, yes. So there's a little bit of um, dissent. That's great, I love that. Um, so it was a consultation. Yeah, somebody wanted to answer five minutes. So these are really good points, right? So I was the one who decided what your options were to answer this. Now, how would you feel if I would suddenly do a presentation that would last three hours um, and completely ignore what I've asked you, then it would be even less valuable to even ask you the question. It would be probably worse than just doing a presentation. So um, what shows then is that it's really key um, for us to not just ask and listen, but also to adapt and act depending on what, um, on what uh, you know, people tell us. And uh, Crystal is very nicely saying that she would wonder if we could trust um, or if, if you could trust me um, after that. And that's absolutely true. So this is, I think, a really nice little exercise to make us feel and a little bit aware of um, what does it mean if we just go out and we ask some questions um, where people can only fill in uh, pre-decided answers. and um, we don't act on that and we don't uh, show people that we actually listen to them. So this is one of the key lessons that we found all over again. I'm going to very briefly go through three key points, 
one kind of the building blocks of um, community engagement and accountability. And I do include uh, risk communication in that, but that is uh, the acronym that we use, CEA, so apologies for that. Um, why inclusion is very important for good community engagement and accountability and the other way around and some of the key steps. Because we're short on time, I will run through some of the, the slides rather um, quickly, but I will try to still uh, speak clearly and without a lot of um, acronyms to make it a little bit more accessible and you will get the slides at the end as well and there is a recording of course. So one of the key points is of course trust and that has been running through all of the presentations of the colleagues today. And um, how do we build trust? Well, uh, first I would like to invite you to ask people first and then message later. So asking what are the knowledge gaps, asking what are um, the concerns, the questions and so on. And sometimes those might hide behind rumors or misinformation. It's really important that we remember that it's not just about us bringing solutions, but that people have solutions and sometimes we should even dare to bring problems. So we should troubleshoot together with communities to find solutions that suit them, that come from them and that we can support. Feedback is one of the key elements and we've heard a little bit about that today already. It's important that we first engage, but also that we document and most importantly, that we address and adapt based on that feedback. And we have to show people that we are doing that. Um, we need to be transparent and timely, of course, so that we can gather people's trust. And language is really important. And with that, I don't just mean the language that people are speaking in terms of uh, I'm a native uh, German speaker, let's say, let's say but um, also in terms of using familiar words. We are very good at creating our own acronyms and our own humanitarian language. And we need to make sure that our language is inclusive and accessible as well. Now, um, why is this important? Well, one of um, the things that we did in the Asia Pacific region was a survey and one of the findings was that quite a lot of people, almost one in two, believed a little um, or fully that a specific group is responsible for the spread of COVID-19. Um, now, that is of course a huge issue around stigma that we need to address. And um, the way that we've done that was that uh, we've had uh, kind of a survey form in lots of different um, uh, languages uh, with a lot of open questions as well. And um, that was led by WHO, IFRC, National Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies, OCHA and UNICEF. And we found out a lot of interesting things. The stigma question was the most interesting, but there was also a question on um, communication preferences. And we found that people use social media a lot, but they actually don't trust it so much. Um, so we need to make sure that we adapt accordingly. There is a dashboard as well that uh, you can access publicly and you can look at the different countries that we have data from. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk about is inclusion. And obviously, you uh, know quite a lot about that already. But um, this is, you know, going back to the first exercise, imagine that um, you would have any kind of vision impairment or that you wouldn't be um, a native English speaker or that you might be dyslexic, for instance, then that poll that I launched, you wouldn't have had a chance to answer probably. So we need to make sure that we don't just listen to the loudest voices, but we actually listen to the ones that um, are really, uh, you know, to, to everybody and that we actively reach out to them. One of the things that we've done in the Asia Pacific region as part of the um, RCCE working group has come up with a very short uh, guidance note and I know we're all suffering by uh, near death by guidance notes and webinars but um, I hope this one is <laughs> a bit useful it has uh, it's very short it has one update based on the input that we've received 
and um, it uh, gives different groups that might be marginalized or vulnerable. This is one example. So persons with disabilities, um, and we say, why are they um, especially vulnerable? Why do we need to make an extra effort to include them? And uh, then we give some concrete actions to include this group. So for instance, um, doing active outreach, uh, using clear and familiar terms, um, accessible formats, etc. So you can go through all of the different groups and see what are some key actions that you can take. In addition to that, we have a matrix that um, summarizes all the key actions and goes through different um, groups and uh, links you to further research if you want to um, get into more detail. So finally, I just want to give you a couple of key takes away, takeaways. Um, one is including different groups of different people in different ways. So making sure that we don't just think of uh, the you know, loudest voice, but that we actively find out who are the different vulnerable groups and how can we include them. Asking first, so making sure that we don't just message, but we give content and that answers a little bit the language question that I saw in the chat earlier. If we give content and uh, kind of let go of control a little bit, then um, people can uh, go ahead and um, you know share that content and revise the format. We need to listen as we heard have heard before. And of course, trust is um, absolutely crucial. Um, we have to make sure that people actually understand what we're saying and that it's useful to them. And we have to adapt the kind of content that we share. It's important that we don't just have leaders to talk, but that we have um, also just regular people speak up. So there's a number of resources and you will get the PowerPoint as well. Um, I'd like to highlight the interagency Google Drive with lots of um, different language uh, content for you um, to use and adapt and uh, feel free to get in touch as well. Um, I'm now handing over and just to let you know, I've asked you how long um, I should take and in about 20 seconds, my timer will go off. So um, I've kept with the wish of the majority to stay in uh, 10 minutes. And um, now I'm glad to hand over to Pilar Peña and um, Diana Medina. Pilar is a con, um, is a lawyer and also a community-based protection officer at UNHCR. And Diana is my colleague, um, a CEA manager at the IFRC in the Americas. Over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to present um, the Regional Information and Communication Needs Assessment. This is an uh, interagency tool that helps us to understand the information and the communication needs of refugees and migrants in the context of the Venezuela situation. Oh, sorry, I have a problem. Yeah. Um, this assessment was uh, conducted as a joint effort of the regional CWC C4D working group, which is part of the regional interagency coordination platform for refugees and migrants of Venezuela, and in coordination with the national platforms, which is the same structure, but at the national level. It was the first regional simultaneous evaluation conducted in this context. Uh, we saw that there were different initiatives that were carried out um, to collect information on the communication needs of refugees and migrants. However, not all of them were uh, conducted in a structured and systematized way in all of the countries. So this um, gave us the opportunity to have a common baseline to understand what are the information and communication needs of the different population groups. Um, this uh, assessment helped us to analyze information, compare the trends, measure the impact in order to get, have some feedback that would help us to improve our strategies, interventions, and tools in 2020. The regional assessment was conducted in the second semester of uh, 2019. It covered 15 countries across the region, uh, Mexico, some countries in Central America, uh, the South America, and some countries in the Caribbean more than 3,400 uh, refugees, migrants, and host communities participated in this exercise. It was, uh, as mentioned, as a, a joint effort uh, 
with different actors, including uh, communities, uh, community-based organizations. Um, the implementation was uh, conducted in several stages. We had four stages, uh, first a desk review, uh, we developed some tools using some global tools that were contextualized to the specific situation of the Venezuela. Uh, and we were able to test the tools uh, in Colombia. We, we had uh, the testing in uh, border areas and in some urban settings. And then we have the, the stage of the data collection and the analysis and the drafting of the report. Some of the tools that we use in order to collect the, the, the data was a uh, Sorry. Sorry. Um, in order to collect the data was the main survey, uh, survey questionnaire that was uh, uh, conducted, individual interviews conducted with the support of um, enumerators. We had an online self-administered survey where, where refugees and migrants could directly fill out the information. We had a questionnaire for key informant interviews and some uh, tools for, uh, to conducting the focus group discussions. All of this information is available in the r4b.info website in the microsite for the CWC C4D working group. I'm gonna explain quickly some of the key findings that we had uh, with this assessment. Uh, we're, we will not go into all of the details, but you can find in the report, uh, this is the segregated data and all of the information um, for each uh, section. Some of the main findings are that 70% of the people interviewed have access to a mobile phone. 79% of the people interviewed have access to the internet. Only 29% of the people in transit have access to Wi-Fi hotspots. And only one out of two uh, persons feel informed. The main sources of information um, are WhatsApp, Facebook, and the television. Here uh, in the report, you're gonna see some uh, information as mentioned, uh, the segregated, for example, in terms of access to communication. Uh, we have a uh, we have some uh, information about the use of mobile phones. 70% of the people, as mentioned, have access to a mobile phone and they use it to connect family, friends, uh, to connect with family and friends, to access the information and to look for information. And in terms of the accessibility to the internet, 79% have access to the internet. Most of the people had the difficulties finding, for example, a Wi Fi hotspot. Uh, and this is uh, that this tell us that there is a need. They have to allocate, for example, their own resources to buying connectivity, and this is very problematic uh, as in in terms of the of the current uh, pandemic. In terms of access to TV, radio, and the press, a uh, majority of the people have uh, do not access these traditional channels. Some of them they lack the the, the devices or the resources. Um, they don't have the resources to buy this uh, this uh, this uh, devices. In terms of the communication channels, one of the main characteristics of the Venezuelan population is that um, they are very connected. They're a very connected one, and they use social media and uh, messaging apps, for example, uh, as their main channels of uh, communication to keep in touch uh, with the family members, friends, and to access the information. And this doesn't mean that they are the most uh, trusted sources of information. At the end of the report, you're gonna see some recommendations. I'm not gonna go through, uh, over through all of them, but you can see that there's a need to increase community engagement and the participation. There is the need to work uh, in, in regional or uh, national interagency initiatives, avoiding duplication, having this joint um, community engagement initiatives, initiatives is key. Uh, there's also a need to invest in digital skills, uh, reinforcing the capacities of refugees and migrants, but also uh, the capacities of the different actors working in the response. Um, the advocacy efforts also need to be strengthened in order to access the co communi uh, communication, the connectivity, and uh, many other recommendations that are very useful uh, to continue and reinforce our, um, our work and our collective efforts. In terms of the impact of the assessment in the COVID-19 response, um, we see that um, this assessment that was published in uh, January 2020 helped us to be better prepared for the needs of the, of the COVID response. It helped us to shape, out, um, shape the outreach to refugees and migrants and to strengthen or establish uh, mechanisms uh, that can be used during the, the COVID-19 response. Uh, for example, we uh, started with an interagency repository with uh, prevention and mitigation messages, 
uh, disseminating it through the preferred channels uh, that uh, persons of uh, refugees and migrants had expressed. Um, we uh, put more efforts in updating, for example, a regional tool that is the regional service mapping uh, that has uh, information about uh, national and local uh, services. Um, we also uh, adapted the information that is shared to, uh, for example, virtual and remote modalities. Uh, we have the support spaces, which is a regional initiative, uh, interagency initiative that uh, provides uh, spaces where refugees and migrants can uh, receive information and orientation on some basic services. We also have uh, interagency, interagency initiatives such as the EU report that is more a, a um, focus on uh, communication with adolescents and um, youth. And we also, um, it was a good opportunity also to um, pilot some um, new initiatives uh, such as the WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp chatbots. Um, we, at as unit here, we have our piloting currently one for Mexico uh, and Ecuador with automated responses and human-based interactions. And we also have a very good initiative that was piloted in Peru. And I'm gonna give the floor to my colleague, Diana, so she can present this initiative. Over to you, Diana. Thank you, Pilar. Um, let me start for giving you some context. In last March, Latin America already emerging as at the epicenter of the pandemic. And on the other hand, Peru was and still is the second country that hosts the largest number of Venezuelan and refugee, refugees and migrants. Additionally, many refugees and migrants work in the informal market and have lost their job and the context, on the context of the pandemic. We felt that it was necessary to have some mechanism to connect with refugees and migrants and as they are one of the most uh, neglected population during the pandemic. And also because they, uh, of the isolation measure, our volunteers have reduced their intervention on the ground. So we asked ourselves that uh, uh, the question of how we can listen and answer to the community if we can be on the ground. Next, please. In uh, next slide, please. In in March two, uh, 20, uh, 2020, the IFRC and the Peruvian Red Cross launched the pilot project that consists in a WhatsApp line to provide information, share preventing messages, and solve concerns from the community. Considering the study that Pilar already presented, we were uh, some of the main where the some of the main findings were uh, the high connectivity of the refugees and migrants and the overwhelming use of WhatsApp as a communication channel, we decided to use this application to implement the information and feedback mechanism we wanted. The tools allowed us to monitor the evolution of the situation in the country and the needs of the community. The line also helped us to establish a communication uh, mechanism to identify rumors and misinformation in a timely manner. Next. It is important to note that although the line focus on migrants and refugees, the general population contact us through the line and of course would they, they receive assistance and we make referrals if it's necessary. The information we had shared through the line has focused in prevention and self-care self messages in terms of COVID, information to correct rumors and uh, answer questions and doubts, referral to the government established mechanism for people who need testing for COVID, provide advice to people who might present some symptoms and clarify, of course, the symptoms, uh, and also information uh, about cash integration program, uh, how to use a uh, ATM, the, uh, the availability of the money in the card, etc. Because in April, we had a cash distribution for refugees and migra migrant population. We have used written messages, graphic, video, audio messages and to disseminate information. This, uh, these are some of the results uh, until September 20th. More than 28,340 messages have been sent. There are currently more than 1,417 um, 1, users. 33% of the users are women and the majority are in the age range uh, uh, of 18 to uh, 39. And about 47% of the users are refugees and migrants. Next, please. The most frequently uh, consulted topics are symptoms, financial assistance, general information, and pre um, preventive measures for COVID. 
most of the interaction are question and the important detail is that also we receive SMS and the platform also has also allowed us to share information and answer and question via SMS. At the moment, the line is growing and we are starting to cover more topics, given that the activities on the ground are being reactivated with livelihood, non-communicable diseases and psychosocial support programs. I wanted to give it the floor uh, to my colleague, Tiago Sote. He is the Associated Protection Officer with the Protection Cluster in South Sudan. And he has been the focal point for PC in the National uh, RCCE Technical Working Group. Go ahead, Santiago. Tiago, sorry. Thank you, Dia. Uh, thank you, Diana. And uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Greetings from South Sudan. I'll be presenting some of the RCC activities undertaken by the protection cluster here. I'll just go through my presentation very quickly. I will skip the context of the country. I imagine that most of the people attending do know about the context of South Sudan. I'll bring specifically some information on the digital availability on the access to internet by people in South Sudan. And the first data that I want to point out is the internet. So according to the International Telecommunication Union, only 8% of the population in South Sudan has access to internet. And when we are talking about a country of around 11 million people, the population, we have just uh, 800,000 people having access to internet. And when we talk about social media, that numbers drops even more. So we have very, very low number of people having access to internet and for social media. So radio is still Tiago, one I'm of so the main sorry. sources would of you, communication. Would you kindly turn off your video? Yes, sure. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. I hope it's better now. Uh, so radio is still remains one of the main resources of communication in the country. However, although radio is more accessible than internet, we still have many families that don't have access to to radio devices as well. And we have been uh, receiving reports from protection partners that many families couldn't follow the educational programs that was being delivered through radio because the schools were closed, because many families didn't have access to radio devices. So this is still a challenge as well to provide radio devices for uh, especially deep field areas, deep field uh, communities. And as part of the COVID uh, response in South Sudan, there was establishment of the National COVID Response Plan. And with some pillars, uh, eight pillars were established. And one of the pillars was the Risk Communication and Community Engaging Technical Working Group, and also state level RCC technical working groups. So the protection cluster has been engaged since the beginning with the RCC in order to ensure that the, all the masses being produced were uh, inclusive, non-discriminatory, and also that protection masses were included in the overall RCC strategy that was being developed and all the masses that were being developed. So I'll bring here just three examples of some uh, activities that were undertaken by the protection cluster. And one of them was the development of some cartoons. The cartoons were uh, in this key protection and human rights considerations in light of the COVID-19 restrictive measures. It was uh, done in partnership with OSHR, UNHCR, and HDC, that is a national NGO. And the cartoons uh, include 10 cartoons with do's and don'ts. So we try to do it in a very easy way for the people accessing this information to be able to understand what were the rights that should be preserved during the COVID-19 time. And this was a very innovative way to reach communities with easy to read information, as I mentioned, on, the, on this basic rise that, that should be maintained during the situation. It's important to highlight that we developed these uh, cartoons based on uh, protection risks that we were receiving from, uh, protection risks that we were hearing uh, being reported by protection partners in all the areas around the country. I'll quickly show one of these cartoons so we can you can see this one is about access to healthcare. So we have the don't where people are being discriminated. And also there is a fee being charged for people to access the health facility while you're in the do. You have all people being able to access, prote protective measures being followed, 
and a sign saying that the health facility is free access for everyone. And then on the bottom, we included the key message about the right that people should know in order to have information and to not uh, see their rights being overthrown because of the restrictive measures. A second activity that we undertook was the use of book SMS. So we partnered with two cell phone companies operating in the country to send this book SMS with key protection and human rights messages as well. On um, this way, we were able to reach thousands and thousands of people with SMS messages without the need to have access to internet connection. So to overcome this challenge of people not having access to internet, we use the traditional way of uh, book SMS. For the three one is on the right to health, uh, once again, to ensure that people know that they should have access to health facilities as well without discrimination and being charged any fee. And the other two on the restriction of movement that shouldn't restrict them to access these health facilities and also that shouldn't be used as an opportunity to harass, you treat or extort people because many reports were done on the protection risk and, and protection incidents happening in this regard. And the third activity was the use of radio shows. So as radio is one of the main ways of communicating with uh, deep food communities here in South Sudan, we use the radio shows, we use the radios one, once again as the main way of delivering uh, messages and communicating with communities, especially those in the, in the deep field areas. So the radio shows were also on protection and human rights considerations. The episodes included topics as child protection, mental health, right to food, uh, about the catarrhea and in intercommunal violence that were happening in the country and the hampered response to that amongst many other protection topics. We had around 10 radio talk shows uh, each week with uh, different people and with different topics. So the episodes had the participation of different heads of UN agencies here in the country, national and international NGOs, and also we had the participations of IDPs. And with the radio shows, we were able to establish actually a communication channel with communities because uh, during the radio talk shows, many callers were uh, calling to the uh, radio station to report on some protection concerns that they were facing and also asking advice on some of these human rights and these uh, protection messages that we're sharing through the show. So these were the three main ways that we found in overcoming this digital, digital access challenge in the country in order to be able to reach all communities, both in urban and also in deep field areas. There were many other activities, but uh, I'll stop here and you can access the data portal of the protection cluster at protection.org. There you can access the cartoons and you can access some of the radio shows and the cartoons will be shared also after, after this event. And I'll stop here and I'll hand over the floor for the closing remarks. And this will be done by Christelle Loop Forest. She's the Deputy Global Coordinator of the Mine Action Area of Responsibility with the United Nations Mine Action Service with the Geneva Office. Over to you, Christelle. Thank you. Can you hear me and see me? We can. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you very, very much for the super interesting session. So I want to thank Rebecca, William, Martin, Mathieu, André, Vincent, Vivian, Thiago, and Pilar for sharing their experience, the findings of their research, and sharing really candidly what they've learned with us. Uh, we really truly appreciate uh, this, uh, this presentation. So my conclusion will start by uh, the way William left us. Information saves lives. Indeed, information can save lives. And uh, it needs aid programming and funding and professionalization of the way we communicate this information as to deliver on this great potential of saving lives, there are many success factors which have emerged from this uh, presentation. First, data must be accurate. 
we need to correct rumors and misinformation and provide good data, which means information in, in uh, investing in information management and data sharing. Two, community uh, engagement and risk communication must be gender diversity and disability inclusive and responsive. So I have behind me a poster from the Global Protection Cluster that really illustrates the diversity, I think, of you know, the affected communities. So we really need to adapt our language and our way of communicating to each of these different uh, groups and persons. Uh, next point, I wanted to highlight innovation. We talked a lot about innovation and it does bring many opportunities as highlighted by Mathieu, but it should be driven for and by local organizations and affected communities as they are on the front lines of conflict. We need to make sure they can actually use this innovation and have everything uh, in place so that it works. Next point I want to highlight trust. Almost all the speakers have highlighted this, the importance of trust. So it's not only about the number of people who receive the information, but do they understand it? Do they trust it? And will they act upon it? I've noticed a question in the chat box. Someone asked, how do we measure trust? And that's a critical question, which I think would deserve a whole uh, a new webinar. But I want to say in my action, when we do risk education activities, we generally measure knowledge, attitude and practices before and after the risk education activities, which help uh, to see if people have trusted the information and, and, uh, and have changed their attitudes and practice. Next point, coordination. So most of our humanitarian system is organized either around specific issues or risk, for instance, food insecurity, gender-based violence, explosive ordnance, or organized on persons, refugees, children, IDPs. So this issue is, is complicated because we all come with our needs assessment, with our communication campaign, our outreach campaign. And frankly, uh, there is the risk of overload of information uh, as we complain that there is a risk of death by guidance in the context of COVID-19, uh, I think that some of the affected communities uh, could well complain about, you know, too many assessments, too many communication and overload. So this issue of how do we coordinate our community outreach is critical and I think that uh, the protection cluster, the ISC resource, resource group working on accountability to affected people uh, and others, we really need to try to, to tackle this uh, at the country level and, and, uh, and, and try to, uh, to make sure we don't uh, tire affected communities. Uh, and my uh, two last point is uh, one of the speakers said it's not just about communications, it's, a, it's about protection. There's many protection issues in this work. So here I want to make a suggestion. Uh, how can we together transform the way we do business so that the affected communities are in the driving seat when it comes to prioritizing the risk that we need to mitigate and address? And I want to share with you uh, a feedback I got some of, uh, recently from, uh, from Haiti. Someone from Haiti was telling me, you know, COVID-19 is the least of our worries. Lawlessness, insecurity, and the fact that this has caused economic activities to stop are the real issues and are leading to food insecurity and, and, which, and, and would get worse in coming months. So we need to really, I think, listen to affected communities about what is it that they really worry about. Um, and, uh, and last but not least, I want to remind you all that there is now an evaluation form. So I would be super grateful if you could uh, comment 
on this uh, on this event and i'm going to just ask uh, our host to share the the evaluation form and that's it for me thanks again to everybody who participated thank you christelle thank you all of the panelists i'm sorry we had to rush you through but we it was such a wealth of riches we couldn't choose between all of your amazing presentations uh attendees thank you for sticking with us incredible we will be back with you within the within the week next next two weeks maybe with a full treatment uh of detailed answers to your questions and all of the panel presentations and the powerpoints and bios and contact information and resources and links for you to follow and we can't wait to hear um more from you here let me put the link to the evaluation in the chat box. This is what it's all about, being responsive to your questions in real time. There you go. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. We're really grateful for your, uh, for your presence and your interest and your questions and your engagement and the work that we know you're going to bring to making RCCE central and responsive information central to humanitarian aid response from here on out. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much.